Honesty, how are we? Welcome back to the Candlelit Tales podcast, where we tell stories from Irish mythology and chat about them afterwards. In this series, we're looking at Cormac McCart, and we have been looking at the great High King and all the light, bright, beautiful things he did. Now in this episode, we're going to delve a bit deeper and discover the darker side of Cormac McCart. As all stories have two different ways and many different ways of looking at the perspectives, we're going to have a little look at the less prosperous stories. If that's something that interests you, you can go back to the start of the series and catch up, or you can go over to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales to show us some support, or make a one-time donation on our website, where you can see our workshops and our live shows and wherever we're going. And if you want to sit back, relax, like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, but most importantly, enjoy this story. Cormac paced up and down. He was in his own tent, removed away from where the battle would be fought the very next day. They were near the River Boyne, by Meliphant, a holy abbey, and that place where worship happened in me the county for the king. The flat lands meant any hills in me overlooked and saw all movement that went through the lands and there had been seen a great fighting force moving down from the north, coming led by Fergus Fiek Dova, Fergus of the Black Tooth, to come and take the high kingship away from Cormac. Any king who is not a fighting king should not be the high king, according to the Illid. The northerners, the Ulster men, who fought ferociously amongst themselves as much as anyone else. But after the insult they had paid to Cormac, it galled him now as he paced up and down his own tent, that he had all but gifted his kingship away when he asked Tyg McCain for help. And although the Munster men rallied under Tyg's support, and Oliel Ullam, the king in the south, had sent Tyg with such a force of Aegonacta and men from Munster that the fighting force would surely squash this rising in the north. Still, Cormac paced, anger beating in his heart, for he knew once won, the kingship could easily be lost. As soon as Tyg McCain went and took his prize, circling as much land as he could take in Brega, circling Tara, circling the throne. And he would be honor bound to give whatever he circled to him after the fight for payment. And yet, although irritated and frustrated by this matter, Cormac went to bed. He tossed and he turned in his blankets, not worrying about Ty. But instead, the thoughts of Lugid Loga entering his mind without trying, simply staying there, this fierce, dark stare the man had, a man who had killed his father, no honor bound to fight for him and bring him back the head of Fergus Fiatdova. He would too. Cormac knew he would. It still didn't sit right with him that he was putting him to work for such a task without demanding a heavier fine for killing his father. In the blink of an eye, it seemed like he slept. Although he did not feel rested, he awoke with new ideas in his head. He smiled, remembering his mother's advice. He did not have to be a fighting king to rule all of Ireland, but he did have to be a cunning and clever king. And he may have to rely on tricks to survive this day. He knew he was not fighting, but his life was at risk nonetheless. And so he asked his servant to dress in his fine clothes and his tunics and his robes and put on his armour and he would wear the servant's clothing as they would sit on the hill overlooking Cairna where the battle below near the Boyne would take place. 
Cormac saw the armies, the darkness on the horizon, the huge numbers of the monster men, the flags and banners snapping in the wind, the horses around the edges, the spears glinting in the sun, the swords, shields, and the clashing now began. He saw Tyg circle in his chariot, leading a great group down and into a bloody battle. It was ferocious, the fighting. Monster men and Ulster men fighting in the middle in Meath. And when they came together, the dark hooded crow that flew over the battle below could have been the Morrigan herself for all of the fury that was displayed below. And then, Cormac saw him, Lugid Loga, in his berserker state, a fury and an anger rising in him, knocking men down. He surely would not know friend from foe. And his squinting eyes went and looked for Fergus in the battlefield, in the melee, in the mess. And he came striding out with a dark head, a Fergus, but not the right Fergus. He came to Cormac and his servant, and he threw the head down in front of him, the anger bristling off him, paying his fine, serving this Eric, this Wergill that Cormac had gifted him, to repay the fact he had killed his father by killing this man, but it was not the right of Fergus. It was not the right Ulsterman, it was not Fergus Fiechdova. Cormac looked at the blood dripping from the sword. The hand that was holding it, clasped, strong, soaked in red. The anger that was bristling off this man was palpable. And so he turned, as if to offer counsel to a king, and whispered in his servant's ear. His servant exclaimed that this was not Fergus Fiechtuva, and this man must still be killed. Lugid Laga was furious, but he turned roaring and ripping up the earth with his running. He ran back into the fight. The fury of his blades brought down many men. The screeching of sword on shield, the screaming of dying men, the clashing of spears and swords, until finally he came out of the mess and the melee and the madness of the battle and came striding up with another head in his hand, this time a dark, heavier head he threw it at Cormac's feet. And once more, Cormac saw that this was the wrong Fergus. And if Cormac had thought Louis Loga had had his berserker rage on him the first time he saw him, he knew it wasn't fully true. This man was vibrating with the anger coursing through his veins. He glared, squinting at Cormac's servant, assuming it was him, pointing at the head and saying, through gritted teeth, that this was the man you wanted killed. Once more, Cormac turned to his servant and whispered in his ear, and once more his servant spoke regally and firmly and said it was not the right man, and he must go now still and find Fergus Fiechtova. Well, the sun was sinking below the horizon. A long day of fighting, and Tyg had seemed to rally and bring about a turning of the tides. They were winning the battle and driving the Ulster men back. And then Cormac saw him. Fergus Fiechtova. In the middle of this brilliant fight, the man who had laughed, scorned and lit his hair on fire in a banquet. And striding towards him was Lugid Loga. He had killed countless men in this fight. And now he cut the head from Fergus faked of his body, toppling it to the ground. Soaked in blood from head to toe, now he grabbed this head and carried it up the hill to Cormac McCart. He threw it on the ground, and he waited for Cormac to nod his agreement. And sure enough, as soon as he did that, 
Lugid Lorga was so angry, he cackled and laughed. He threw back his head and he said he had paid his fine, surely. And he took out his sword and drove it through Cormac McCart. Who he thought was Cormac McCart, at least. Cormac's servant, dressed in his clothing, fell down dead. Cormac stood aghast and waited and watched Lugid Loga fall to his knees, bleeding heavily, panting wearily. He closed his eyes. Cormac surveyed the landscape and the fight below as the dark shadows crept over the dead and those that were still fighting were barely able to stand. The Illid were defeated. Tyg McKenna, he rallied finally and drove the last few running into the hills, far away. But when he came towards Cormac McCart, he too was swooning, near fainting from loss of blood. But he smiled. To see Cormac still alive, still here, and seeming gracious and happy to offer Tyg a chariot. Cormac whispered a quick message to the chariot driver, one of his trusted men, and offered his hand to Tyg McCain. A deal was a deal after all, he said. You go and circle the lands you want. But you must do it now, before the setting of the sun. So Tyg, delirious with blood loss, leapt up onto the chariot, now knowing he only had one last thing to do to secure his kingship of all Ireland. He had fought furiously throughout the whole day, He had the words of the king and monster Oliel Olam in his head. Whatever he had to do to secure the kingship, he should do. And he did it. He had won the fight, and now all he had to do was encircle the hill of Brega, the hill of Tara, in this one last dash. His eyes were heavy, his breathing deep and hard, and his head felt light. And every time he blinked, it seemed a long time until light came back through his eyelids. He was not balanced. He was going from one foot to the other, passing trees, passing streams. He asked the chariot driver to turn, turn. And each time he seemed to turn against the way he was going, but... He knew he would simply come around the hill soon enough. After all, he was soon to be king. But in these moments, when he closed his eyes and he felt like swooning near fainting from loss of blood, the chariot driver would turn away from the circle. And he was not circling the land at all, but ducking in and around in between the trees, forest, landscape and going about a certain way that he knew this monster man had no clue. He had no idea of the landscape here. He didn't know the tracks and the trails, the bohreens and the small roads. And so it was not long until they came to the River Liffey. And when they got there, Tyg McCain realised he had been made a fool. He should have brought his own chariot driver, but he was so weak, he was so ill now, that he just simply asked the chariot driver to bring him back to the camp. Well defeated, but well received by Cormac McCart. A burning smile that didn't meet his eyes. Cormac said he needed medical attention, and he asked for the healing chamber to be made ready for Tyg McCain, and his best physicians would see to him, he promised Tyg that. And he had promised the same to the unconscious Luigid Loga. The two men were so badly wounded they'd lost such an amount of blood, the physicians would have to work hard to restore them back to their strength. But Cormac had given them slightly different orders this time. The idea that had come to his head, how 
to instill fear, how to let stories spread, to not mess with Cormac McGart. He had an idea, and he made the healers do it. To stitch up their wounds, give them the healing herbs and the broths, while they were stitching, to take the beetles and stitch them into their wounds alive so they would rummage around, picking and eating, crawling and surviving inside of these two men, one who had killed his father and was willing to kill him too, one who had played a nasty trick and trying to take away the kingship from Cormac. All of the anger that he had slept with, a loud course through his veins, was let out when he heard the screams of agony. The waking men seemed horrified. When the screams came to Cormac's ears, he walked down towards them, slowly, allowing them to feel it, the pain, the anger, the fury. The remembrance that would sink in slowly as to why they were being so tortured, and who it was that they had insulted. Yes, they had fought for Cormac and won him back his throne, but a lesson must be learnt. And so as he walked slowly, the grass being crushed under his feet, squelching of mud in the soft earth, the blood that had poured into the ground of me near the river boy and had soaked it near red. And now he saw these two men in two chambers, pulled apart and barely sane, their eyes rolling in their heads. He visited Tyg first, who could not speak, he was in such agony. He visited Lugid Laga second, the berserker rage ringing almost around in his head. He was furious. But when Cormac asked him how his father had fared the day he had killed him, Lugit Loga howled with anger. And he said he had bleated like a goat, he bellowed like a bull, and he'd screeched like a woman. And in that rage, in speaking so vehemently, the wounds that had been stitched up burst open and all of the beetles bleating, running, scurrying, ran out and left Lugid Laga standing, bleeding, heaving with breath, but somehow still standing. He grabbed the nearest physician and told him to sew him up properly this time and he'd make his way back to Munster, alone. Surely Cormac knew this man wouldn't trouble him again, and the story of the beetles being stitched into his wounds would grow legs. When he visited Tyg McCain, he was gone. He'd been taken away by his own men. He had sent messages to Aliel Ullam, the king in Munster, looking for help from the Aegonacta. Somehow, under a screeching, screaming, agonizing road down to Munster, he met with physicians that painstakingly peeled back the skin, opened up the wounds and picked out the beetles one by one. In such an agonizingly torturous surgery, he would never go back to Meath, and he would never dream of being a High King again. Although Cormac knew there was rumblings and grumblings of war on the horizon from the Aegonacta, from the men in Munster, and from all Eel Ullam, who had been insulted to hear Tyg had been so mistreated. So Cormac knew he must make some form of offering to the kings down below in Munster. And so he offered 
Tyg McCain, a cousin on his mother's side. A gift. The price of the land he had managed to go near but not around. And everyone knew the land in Brega was some of the best in all Ireland. The price was no small fee. But he sent it and it was received. And the men of Ulster were defeated and didn't tell this story very often afterwards. But the men of Munster liked to repeat it. They liked to be remembered for beating the men of Ulster in this particular fight. And they liked to remember the story of Cormac McGart. Not a story that shunned Cormac McGart in great light. A story that showed his trickery and his cunning and his dark side. And they were more wary of him than the smaller kings. They were more wary of this man who might curry favour in any direction, who was sweet-tongued enough to convince many fighting men to fight for him. He was just, he was true, but he was cunning and clever too, and that scared more of the fighting men in Ireland than did a show of strength any day. Now it wasn't long until Cormac McGarth got one of three of his magical properties that he became well known for. And it was his sword that shone in the light like a candle that was remembered. And it wasn't long after he claimed the kingship back in the Battle of Cairnda near Meliphant in the Boyne when the Ulster men and Munster men had to fight it out that a man named Suck came to Cormac, claiming his sword had been stolen by a man named Duiv Dura. Duiv Dura had indeed stolen it after a great banquet and a feast. He'd inscribed his name on it. So when this case was brought to Cormac McGart, Duiv Dura simply showed his name in the inscription on the hilt below saying it must be his sword, after all, it had his name on it. Cormac looked to Sucked, who explained to him that this sword had been found driven through his grandfather. So anyone who had a name on it, whether it was recently carved or not, must have been the killer of his grandfather. So Cormac turned to Dweev Dara and said, and Eric, a fine, <laughs> a wear guild must be paid for the death of Sukt's grandfather if this sword is truly yours. Cormac held the sword in his hand, weighing it, feeling it, sensing something mythical about it. As he looked up to Dweev Dura, Dweev Dura confessed that he had stolen it after a banquet after many drinks had been had and Sucked had stumbled out and fallen into the grass. He had taken the sword from him and inscribed his own name upon it. Cormac looked to his druids and asked a council with them for the night. He told the two that he would give his judgment in the morning. And when his suspicions were confirmed by the well-wise Shanachies of the land, he came back and told Sucht and Dweev Dura that this sword once belonged to the legend Cúchulain, and it was in the north that this had done so much dealings of death. But this sword had also killed his own grandfather, Khan of the Hundred Battles. And with this, all agreed that this sword that shone in the darkness should not go back to Suck, but should remain with the High King, with Cormac MacArt. If his grandfather's blood was on it, it was more his than Suck's who had left it be stolen from him in a drunken stupor. And so it was that Cormac had one of his magical artifacts, one that was well known. 
the other a branch, and the other a goblet. And how we got those, well, that's another story. <laughs>